Hi everyone, welcome to After Class with Ballet for All, a podcast by two passionate adult ballerinas about all things adult ballet related and some random thoughts in between. We're so glad you're here. So grab your water bottle or a cup of coffee and join us for a quick chat after class. Hi, Elena, how are you? Good, thank you. So I'm excited for this episode today because this one, this idea came from watching a YouTube channel. I know we've talked about this, um, watching a YouTube channel for another adult ballet dancer. And she was telling this story about how she went to one of her first adult ballet classes in person and the teacher was marking the combination and she sat down while the teacher was doing it and she got yelled at in front of the whole class (laughs) i know i was like oh this poor girl and so this episode i know we've talked about wanting to do this one just to help people not have that kind of experience because there are so many unspoken rules in ballet that you could really easily accidentally do something like that and then get scolded in front of the whole class and be embarrassed and that is definitely not the kind of first experience that we want anyone to have so yeah we're excited for this one definitely there's so many things that you shouldn't do in class that you will think as me as a ballet teacher i will think like they they make sense they are very logical things you shouldn't do but if no one tells you you just can't guess them so we're going to help you to get into your first ballet class with the better knowledge that you can have, like as best as you can, following as many rules as you can. Yeah, hopefully this is helpful. That's the goal. Yeah, definitely. So what what do you think would be like, you get to your ballet class for the first time, what would you think? What would the first thing that comes to mind? So I think the first thing is just arriving early. Um, I would say ballet is kind of one of those things where early is on time and on time is late (laughs) because really a lot of ballet classes at least the studios i've been to and i know even for our online classes they start very punctually so um if you walk in right at the advertised start time most other people will already be kind of settled in at the bar in their spot and you know that kind of takes a couple minutes set your stuff down change into your your ballet shoes and so Um, I would say getting there early is definitely the first thing that I recommend to people. If you want to be able to have time to stretch, which most people do, I like to get ready for class and get kind of in either my garage for online classes or to the studio if it's in person about 20 minutes early to stretch. So I think that's a a big one. What do you think? Definitely. Like um, we can mention our online lessons. I will open the chat at least. The latest will be five minutes before the classes start. And sometimes if you are not there, like we start classes at 11 my time. And if you are not there 11.01 by the time you join the class, I'm either already playing the music for the first exercise or I'm already (laughs) marking through the first exercise. So you will be changing and running through like, oh my gosh, she's already (laughs) doing the first exercise. How I'm not. So I will say that definitely me as a teacher, I love arriving to the studio in person classes at least 30 minutes earlier because I like to be there arranging the music, making sure that I'm my shoes are in my bag, that I'm not missing anything as a teacher. And for you as a student, it's really important to be warm. Although you're going to do a little bit of a warm up in the class, but it's very challenging. So make sure that you get ahead like a little bit on time, even 10 minutes ahead of class before class is going to make the difference. So go there, do a little bit of footwork, or just get to mm-hmm. know the people, like get, or even go to talk to a teacher. The teacher will appreciate to for you to introduce a little bit earlier, so that way she gets or him they they get to say your name. So that would be pretty mm-hmm. pretty first thing to learn. Get on time. <laughs> yeah, I agree, and I feel like it's one of those things too that as you are dancing longer, you'll realize that there are certain parts of your body that you'll probably want that extra time <laughs> to stretch. So like for me, I have lower back issues. And so that's one of the the reasons I'm so disciplined about getting to class early is because like my lower back needs that time for some extra, extra love and attention. So you'll, you'll find what your thing is. <laughs> Usually the longer you dance, you'll find where your little aches and pains are that you'll be like, I need to get to the studio to stretch that part of my body. So that's kind of a, a practical reason for arriving early as well. So what would be like a second one that you feel like is a a big one that people should know? 
Something big, especially, this is more special to in-person meal classes, is never ever walk with your street shoes on the dancing room. Never ever. <laughs> like as soon as you see that special ballet flooring, take your shoes off and walk through with your shoes in your hands or leave them outside. I personally will appreciate if you leave your shoes outside. As soon as you enter the, the dancing in a studio, take, them, take the shoes off and walk towards your dancing room without your street shoes. That is just number one, to keep the studio clean first. And second, it's sacred. Like our ballet floor, it's, my God, it's pressure. It's our treasure. So it's really important. I would say that that's number two. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. I know a lot of times the ballet floors, they tend to show, like a lot of times they're not um, black. Like I know that mine at my house and then at the studio is like a kind of a light gray. And so they'll show scuffs. Yeah. And then another thing too that I thought of the other day that I was like, oh, that's another good reason not to wear street shoes is a lot of times, I mean, not necessarily in ballet choreographically, but at least when you're stretching, like you'll end up laying on the floor. <laughs> and so I'm like, the, the cleaner the floor is, it's nice for when you're laying on it. So leaving your street shoes outside of the room or taking them off at the door and carrying them to your spot against the wall helps keep the floor a little less nasty for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> it's always true. We don't think, we don't really think about it, but like, I don't really, sometimes you see ballet teachers that go with their street shoes to teach ballet. First, I find this unprofessional. Second, I think it's not really conducive to teaching well ballet because you cannot really point your toes. And third, everyone at some point, your students, and we're going to talk about this, but everyone at some point sits on the floor for a little bit or they put their hands on the floor. We might do some stretching. You don't really want all that dirt and all that on your back or your hands. So it is true. It's a fair point. Yep. Keep your studio clean and don't wear your street shoes in the studio. <laughs> so we're all that story. So number three kind of tying into that, I think, is where you set your belongings, which could include your shoes if you don't leave them outside. And I feel like this one kind of varies from studio to studio. Like this is one of those things that if it was my first time taking a class somewhere, I would kind of just be looking around to see what everyone else is True. doing. Because some studios I've been to, they have like little cubbies that are outside of the room where you could put your your bag and your shoes. Um, and then some studios, like I feel like especially more with adults, people want to be able to bring their stuff with them just because it's like you have your phone and your wallet and other valuables. And so... They kind of let you bring your stuff in and but some places it's like you can take it to your spot at the bar and some places it's like everyone kind of piles it in one corner so i think where you set your stuff is kind of one of those etiquette things that will vary from studio to studio is there something that you've kind of seen more often yeah so i will say that a big percentage of studios will ask you to put it like in a corner, put it away from the bar, because the reality is once you start moving legs on the bar, you don't want to your neighbor's uh, bag be in the middle, interfering with your mm -hmm. movements. You don't want them also kicking the bag around. And that's something else like, you don't want anything hanging on the bar or close, like even the bottle of water. Like I will ask, me as a teacher, I will ask everything to be in a corner, not obstructing my view as a teacher. and I need everything to be really tidy, really clean, really <laughs> neutral. I don't want like nothing that can distract me because, oh my God, that drives me crazy. But I will say, if, if you're allowed to bring it into a studio, don't really put it close to you because it's gonna disturb you. Like it was gonna make your movement maybe a little bit like aware of, oh, I'm gonna kick the bag or I might do this. So it will limit you a little bit. Yeah, the amount of times I've been in a class and We've been doing like grand bottles and you hear a water bottle get kicked <laughs> over. <laughs> it's like a joke. It's like a, a running joke. I feel like in ballet classes, even my other teacher a lot of times says it before she gives us a specific combination. She'll be like, and move your water bottles before this one <laughs> because it's like you'll inevitably hear this like dong in the middle of the class where someone like kicks their metal water bottle and it falls <laughs> over. So be aware if you can bring your water to the bar, which I'm one of those people that I have this like paranoid attachment to not having water on me at all times. And so I'm guilty of bringing my, my water bottle to the bar as long as it's allowed. Just make sure you place it somewhere where you're not going to give it a, a swift kick during <laughs> the exercise. 
an extra note to the musical, the, to the music of the class, and we keep going. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, all right, so what do you think about number four? Well, now that we're already into the studio, so we walked through the classroom, <laughs> we already put the things in a corner, now we're gonna start the class, right? How do we start the class? If we think logically, we have two legs and we're always gonna move Mostly, we're going to start with the right leg, and we want that leg to be away from the bar. Therefore, one of the rules in ballet is you will always start with your left hand on the bar. Very interesting note about this, though, is in Cuba, we never start in the ballet school in Cuba. We don't start with hand on the bar at all because we start with both arms on brava and all the combinations to start with the breathing of the arms and then your, bar, your hand goes to the bar. So that's why I didn't learn that we start with left hand on the bar. Oh, interesting. Yeah? But you can either think of both. You either start with left hand on the bar or think about right leg away from the bar. You're always going to start in either way. So if you put your, your place, your left hand on the bar, which leg is away from the bar? Right leg. So either way you think about it, that would be for sure the next thing to think about. We always start at the bar. Yeah, and I feel like this is a big one that I've seen um, confuse beginners because it, again, is one of those kind of unspoken etiquette rules in ballet that unless you grew up taking classes as a kid, you probably wouldn't know. And so especially when there's bars, you know, in the center and along the wall and there are different angles, I've seen a lot of times beginners come in and they kind of don't register that everyone's <laughs> facing the same way and so they just start whatever way is comfortable and then part way through the combination you know the teacher will be like um turn around left hand on the bar <laughs> so I know that that's a really common one that that people just and it's like why would you know that if you've never been told you know so that's one that if you kind of go in and know you can be confident that you're going to start with your left hand on the bar yeah then it's kind of one less thing to have to mentally manage feeling like a beginner because you already know that one. So another one kind of related to the bar, which is number five, is turning towards the bar to change sides. So you want to give us your take on this as a teacher? Oh my God. It wouldn't kill me. It wouldn't bother me that much if you start facing the, with your right hand on the bar. That would be okay. And I would just quickly ask you, just turn towards the other side. But as soon as you turn towards the other side away from the bar, my blood will start to boil. <laughs> I don't know why, seriously, I have no idea why, but if you turn away from the bar, it just, it just makes me mad. It just makes me like, it's like you offended <laughs> me. It's like you're doing it to offend me. And it's not just it's personal, so it's just you learn you will start with your left hand on the bottom. You are going to change to the other side. You change towards the bar. So you substitute hands. And that's it. It's very easy. It's such a short trip. All that, meanwhile, you go away from the bar. And it, I, I don't know why. It, it just makes me mad to think about it. I don't know why. It's funny that it's like this, this like teacher pet peeve. I'm sure that you're not the only one. Because I think for someone who's not a teacher, it's like, towards the bar, away from the bar. Like, what difference does it really make? But for a teacher, it's like, you're killing my soul <laughs> if you turn away from the bar instead of towards it. So um, that's, again, just like one of those unspoken etiquette things where like, unless the teacher specifically calls it out in the combination, which most of the time they won't, because again, they assume everyone knows turn towards the bar. But it's one of those things that like, if you just naturally, for some reason, wanted to turn away from the bar, and then you might totally traumatize your teacher especially if your teacher is Yelena <laughs> just towards the bar someone decided a long time ago that it was towards the bar someone in the powers that be in ballet decided it was towards the bar and so that is what we do unless you are specifically told otherwise <laughs> you know what I think I'm gonna google if there is a story behind this and for part two because this is there are so many unspoken rules that we might need to do a part two I'm going to Google it, and if there is a reason why, we're going to bring it to the episode two, for sure. We have to. Like, it has to be a story behind why inside the bar. So funny. So that kind of leads, I guess, we're, we're at the bar. Now, what would be kind of the next one for, for number six? What is the next unspoken rule? I will say 
try to mark the exercise with the teacher. Even though you can't really guess what the teacher is going to do, you can't anticipate the steps. If the teacher starts doing two dandies forward and one to the side, you don't just look at the teacher and stare at the teacher like, oh, she's doing it very prettily. Oh, look at those toes and point and nope. The idea is you follow the teacher's movement and you try to like reproduce them as well. And you're not just being respectful because if you are just standing there, you're wasting your time, you're not memorizing the exercise, it's impossible for you just by seeing. Well, I mean, it is a little bit difficult to memorize an entire exercise just by looking and not reproducing. And why is first you create muscle memory. So you are already teaching your muscles. Ah, okay, the exercise does in one and two and to the side and your arm open and close. And you will slowly begin to create that habit and then that muscle memory. And third, you might have a question may pop up like, oh, wait, I know how to do tandis, but I never learned to do a sotenu. So you can raise your hand and ask your teacher, teacher, I don't actually know how to do sotenu. And there you find out before this, the combination started with music and you got lost in the middle of the class and you're the only one moving in the opposite direction to everyone which is a little bit embarrassing when you are in your first few classes and you're like, oh my God. Yeah, so that's very important. Always mark the exercise with the teacher. Yeah, I like to think of that that time frame where you can mark the exercise as like your, your trial run. <laughs> it's like you get a chance to kind of work it out as best as you can before the music starts. And if the music starts is kind of the the real deal, the performance, so to speak, the, the marking it is your your rehearsal. So using that as your your rehearsal time for the combination, I think it will help you get the most out of doing it once the music starts, which I think marking the exercise leads perfectly into our unspoken rule number seven, which is going back to the, the story I was telling at the beginning of the episode about the girl who sat down during class. Um, that is a, a big one of not sitting down or even standing in relaxed positions. That one is, uh, I mean, when someone is talking at you, you are in a restaurant and one of your friends are right. You don't stay sitting there and just like, ah, hi, hi, hi. And you talk at them like for 20 minutes, you sit in and someone else is standing. That's kind of exactly, not exactly the same, but it's kind of the way I think it will come from. Like the teacher is talking at you and the teacher is just like, you're just sitting there, not being active, not being productive, not learning the exercise. I understand we are adults. You might be in a little bit of pain. You might be very tired, but don't just sit. Yeah, so to me as a teacher, it will give me that like, feeling of you are not really engaged with the class. You're not really interested in the exercise. Meanwhile, it could be totally different. It could be like you are like really trying to focus on, oh my God, what is this? And the best way to do is go back to the other point mark the exercise with a t-shirt yeah and i think this is one that would definitely um the reaction that you might get from the teacher would probably vary depending on how old school or not the teacher is like i know some of the more old school teachers like it sounds like the the one that the girl was describing in the video she probably was would like flip out a little bit if you were sitting down whereas i i know other teachers that probably wouldn't even say anything but it's just one of those things that like other people in the class would probably be like oh she shouldn't be doing that especially like if you said if it's just because you're tired you know it's one thing if you have to excuse yourself because you're having a physical issue that's different but um I think in ballet there's kind of just this this idea that body language is important. I mean, that's the whole premise of the class is we're there to use our bodies and communicate through our bodies. And part of that isn't just in doing the choreography. It's how we're presenting ourselves while we're in the class and and showing up and being engaged through the whole class and showing that through our body language to so like not crossing our arms in front of our chest. Like I know we've talked about that's a really big one. Again, especially if you've had more of like an old school teacher. Like I remember when I was a kid having teachers where if you were to like cross your arms or fold your arms across your chest, it would be taken as like a sign of just like disrespect, like almost like, oh, I'm I'm too I'm too cool to like, you know, to be engaged. And so standing in positions where you're you're engaged, you look attentive, you look awake, you look like you're paying attention. 
And again, like you said, if you're marking the exercise, that kind of takes care of that anyway. The last one for this episode, you want to take it? Yeah, so I will say the spacing within the bar. So if there is like a Crowder studio, there is like a lot of you, but now we are in like the start of the new year and it's getting a little bit crowded in classes, more people have new, new year's mm -hmm. resolution. I'm going to do ballet and it's gonna last, who knows, maybe five years, but maybe five days. So I would say the most important part of the spacing within the bar is that you can lift your leg in front of you without really like touching the, your partner in front of you or behind you and that would be perfect. And then your teacher should teach you a little bit how the distance between you within the bar. So that's a little bit more personal. You are not really on top of the bar, but you're not too far away so you can have the right support from your mm -hmm. hand bar, the band, the hand that goes on the bar. But I would say find enough space between you and the two partners that you have in front of you and behind you because yeah, you don't want to just do a ground butt man, lift that leg super high and they just kick the, the, the one in front of you. You don't want someone kicking you either. You're like, come on. Like, I feel like a little hack for that too. Like I know there's been a couple of times where I've taken a, a class that's crowded and there's no more bars that you could move to to space out. And a little hack is to just kind of angle your body towards the bar a little bit so that your leg is kicking more out towards the center of the room and less, you know, behind you. Um, so that way, because sometimes it's like, if you're even a little bit in doubt that you didn't give yourself enough clearance, it's better to just do that little tweak of an angle exactly. towards the bar and kick your leg out. So that way you don't accidentally <laughs> kick somebody. True. That can be awkward. And depending on how much force you're using, it could be really painful for the person behind you. So yeah, so that's a, a definite. And that one I feel like too is kind of even just like a an etiquette thing with like, not wanting to feel like you're on top of each other in class you know like people want a little bit of breathing room in ballet like that's definitely happened to be before in classes where someone's come and you can tell it's their first class and they like stand really close to you at the bar even though there's like other space that they could go and you're like hi you're very close to <laughs> you're very close can to you me right now <laughs> Can you imagine doing a pour de bras and the first thing that you have right in front of your face is someone else's glutes? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's good to have your own space, you know? Yeah, especially <laughs> if you have it in the studio, like err on the side of giving people space and going towards kind of an unclaimed area because people generally, again, because you are doing kicks and you're like bending forward and bending back, it's like you want to have space, so... Give people, privacy. give people their space, yeah. <laughs> space, privacy, your your personal bubble. People enjoy that. So um, I know that kind of is different for everyone. Some people are more comfortable with people close to them than others. But I think erring on the side of giving people room is is a good is a good tip. So definitely, I'm so glad. I hope this helps someone else, right? Yeah, I do too. I hope it gives people, um, yeah, like you said, just a little more confidence coming into class that you're kind of have been given some of the unspoken rules that you don't commit some of the the faux pas that you wouldn't know about otherwise. So thank you guys so much for listening and we will catch you on part two of the episode. Definitely. Bye. Thank you for listening to After Class with Ballet for All. Join the community on YouTube and Instagram or come dance with us, our weekly Zoom classes for adult ballerinas like you. Links included in the episode description. Special thank you to our sponsors. See you next time after class. Podcast produced by Mission Bridge Media.